I'd like to welcome everyone to the afternoon session of our uh, final MARC reviews. The, the work that you will see represents a thesis project that has been begun in October, essentially. Now, each student has an opportunity to develop a brief themselves. We have no common brief, but we do have a set of expectations that each student will uh, look not only at a project in detail, and the emphasis is upon design development within the project, but there's an expectation that the project has sufficient power to initiate or nurture the transformation of an urban area. So thinking about the qualities of an urban area become a, part, a, a significant counterpart of the investigation of what a project might do. And this transformation is meant in a way to be attentive to the drivers of change. That is, how will new sources of value be found? These might be social value or economic value, but in the, the emphasis is on asking the question, why might a project that would hopefully be innovative, why would it be relevant or possible now? Uh, so the, all three of these aspects of the student work should come through. Uh, and each student will be at a certain liberty to emphasize one thing over the other. But within the MARC, we would like the, the project itself to be, in a way, the strongest element, that the project can, be, can hold itself well in comparison with either an historical trajectory or a set of alternatives. Now, sometimes those set of alternatives might be foregrounded, or other times they may sit in the background. But the, we, we want students to be aware of those comparisons. Um, the, the, there's a, a couple of things that perhaps for Graham's benefit I should mention. Housing and urbanism does like to put residential life at the heart of all of our urban transformations. Uh, and so we tend to think of a, a kind of subtext of all of our work as something like housing plus. Now, there are some, some uh, let's say, peripheral cases. And, and, and in fact, in Ray's work, the, one of the ones that we'll, the, the one we'll see at the beginning, the, the uh, residential component is, in fact, very minimal compared to the larger emphasis of the thesis. But I'll come back to that in a second. But for the most part, we, we want students to be thinking in terms of what is driving change in the ways of living and the architecture of housing, the development of housing, that will enable us to see interesting crossovers between urbanity and domesticity, let's say. Now, um, I, I would also like to emphasize that while we are delighted when we see full resolution of a project, we're more interested in, as a program in opening up a series of important questions where the student has an opportunity to exercise judgment about what matters more uh, within a, uh, a, in a way, a system of prioritizations. So sometimes the, the, there, there will be gaps in the final resolution, but we hope that that is, in a way, indicative of the fact that we all know that architecture is a very collaborative and uh, sort of multidisciplinary practice, and it often takes a full team to get things fully resolved. So the, um, We'll see three students, and as I mentioned, they'll, they'll each have a, an opportunity to speak for about 12 minutes, and then we'll have discussion after each student. And then hopefully at the end, we'll have a, a short bit of time for a, a kind of final discussion about the direction of the program. And I think the, 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 um, what's interesting about both this morning's session and the afternoon is that we have tried to lay out uh, the, the range of, uh, of themes that we're interested in as a, as a program. And this year, we have for the first time uh, projects that are really taking adaptive reuse more seriously as a theme of urbanism. And so in Ray's case, we'll see shortly, he's taken a, a rather ambitious um, uh, 
a bite out of a central city block that seems all but impossible to change and tried to imagine in a very, uh, a very ambitious way how it could uh, start to be in keeping with changing attitudes about uh, educational uh, environments and how they cross over with knowledge clusters that are, are commercializable. And, the, uh, and so we all know that this is, in a way, one of the core directions of change for our knowledge cluster environments. But if we're doing that in the heart of the city, can we do it without tearing everything down? Uh, instead, perhaps stripping back, adapting, reusing, interconnecting, adding. And so this becomes a key question that we're interested in now increasingly as a program. The, the following two projects um, are more based on new build, in, which is uh, where we've traditionally had a stronger in interest. And so I think what we're ultimately trying to do is to, is to see how we can learn by looking both at one and the other and eventually beginning to blend and uh, see the the crossover implications of these uh, of these obvious two different trajectories of design and development. So um, I'm I'm now going to uh, stop uh, and and turn over to Ray as soon as I've had a chance to uh, to introduce our jurors. So we have Lee Bennett, uh, who is a partner at Shepherd Robson, and Lee has the additional distinction of knowing our program exceptionally well. He was uh, our previous external examiner, and so he has seen uh, a number of uh, theses, in including Yasmina Aslakhanova's, uh, which he, for which he was on the review panel and read the thesis as well. Um, and we have Chris Lee. Chris is uh, not only the founding partner of, of Siri Architects, but on the faculty at Harvard. Uh, Chris used to uh, be at the AA and was a, a key figure in establishing a kind of typomorphological uh, approach to reasoning that in housing and urbanism, we also like to perpetuate. Um, we wish we could get Chris back here more permanently. I don't see why he wants to, to travel across the Atlantic all the time. It seems wasteful in an era like this. Um, uh, and so if we could enjoy Chris's presence more often, I think we would all be very delighted. Uh, and finally, um, Graham Howarth. And Graham has been involved uh, with housing and urbanism as a lecturer, as a, as a critic, over many, many years. But seemingly, we always wait too long in between. And, and the gaps grow. And then, uh, of course, we have to pick up and start again. But Graham Howarth's uh, work and leadership in the field, I think, is known to many. And we're delighted to have you back for today. Thanks very much, Graham. Uh, so now I'll turn it over to Ray Shu, who's uh, got, I think, a very provocative uh, approach to rethinking uh, a building as block in the heart of the city in Clerkenwell. Thanks, Ray. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my thesis will talking about the building as block uh, material and spatial in renovation of existing city block uh, for dynamic reuse. We are keeping trying to uh, shape the growth uh, of central of metropolitan and the structure of a cultural cluster. They will have network of highly education and knowledge economy. But when we zoom into the fabric of the street block, they are congested and busy. Sometimes it was limited and closed. Here is the typical uh, central block in the uh, center of London. But the further road used to be the position of the river fleet. So on topography, the, the blocks were formed eight, mi eight minutes, eight meter tight difference. When looking at the facade of this block, the Bleeding Heart Yard and Ely Place, they are really very great and gorgeous. But looking at other facades in Suffering Hill or maybe Greville Street and Chattel Street, they are uh, sealed. So it's hard to imagine who will come here and what's, uh, what's the a reason why they will stay here. But as the uh, <coughs> uses of the city, what we're looking for is the maximum civic value rather than the commercial value. Looking at the 
looking at the, the surrounding area, it's a dynamic neighborhood, urban neighborhood here happened here. There are fire station and the new Linden Museum happened here. Um, and also we have lots of uh, great exemplars. So basically, if we learn into the King's Cross, the all talent buildings, we are get, they're coming together in the same scenes. But the reality is we have to, normally we have to take some movements in a small segment. But we want to achieve the same outcome, like people gather together and living in the center of the city and make the street blocks as a, uh, come together and, and build a architecture with high, highly performance. So should we, uh, how should we achieve that in imagination in the center of the city or center of the block? Should we demolish them all? No, we want to accept them as max as possible. So here is here are some uh, small ideas. Um, based on that, we can um, be a start to exploration. Uh, take advantage of the high difference in the site. Uh, we can uh, rethinking the relationship of the lower ground and the basement of the buildings uh, and make a thick ground, like a continuous space. And here is what where the university happened. We can explore how to reuse this block and rethink the in, inside and outside. So we're stripping, stripping away the volume of, of students, stripping away the elevation, and start to review the meaning of those structure that were offered. So here uh, we, were talk we were talking about the possibility of uh, interconnecting spaces. And also we want to rethinking those lower ground elevations. There are uh, platforms in different heights. They are moved through those structures. Also rethinking the elevation and reuse the uh, existing structure, put some lighter structure above that. And here also want to introduce a student uh, housing so that they could live in this campus and so that the building could be as a switch. We wrap it and as a prescope, periscope to cover the poor area but keep the alley place. The alley place could keep as use of offices or uh, use as uh, administration or finally change in change into a student housing, but we keep that structure and add some of And also we open some, uh, open something that are interconnection, interconnected. So we get a move pattern run through east to west, uh, through the whole building, through the whole block. But in doing so, we also create some new volume here. So we move to the part two, there will be three general approaches talking about the mixed reuse. The Ely place were shaped by the Georgian Terrace House. So that makes us to rethinking and reworking the interior and the back of the Terrace House. As an extension of the Ely place, there will um, be two platform uh, become, uh, they were extend in different heights, become, they will provide new entrance of, to the Terrace House at the back of them. The supporting by three rows of columns we got a chance to overhang the new volume from the new structure onto the top of the terrace house. And also, it will influence the facade of Ely Place. Uh, the lower ground provides a new passage, and the top of that we turned into the roof terrace that will help us to deal with the old building and the new building come together. Um, there will have two uh, living cluster units shaped each other that will shape the void as a patio, which we can see show on the section. Um, on the plan, on the right hand, um, there will be have so, four people share a larger space, or maybe you can divide into two people share one space. Um, so basically, given that there are high difference, so there are two different layout here. On the left hand, uh, the existing terrace house. The frontage and the back of terrace house will get communication um, by the uh, shared parts. We can see the staircase happen here. Uh, in this program, and so can, we can see that in the interior rendering here, uh, we encourage not only between, we encourage the communication, not only between students, but also those buildings. They have to uh, communicate with its surrounding urban uh, environment. And here we go to the second part. We have the condition, 
uh, we got the condition of um, a suffering hill. We got two linear buildings. One is linked to the Charterhouse Street and deal with uh, its condition. Another is facing to the Farrington Road. Uh, but those two, two buildings all together shape the contour of the suffering hill. These two, buildings are, these two buildings are closed, so we have to remove parts of stories and remove these facades. Uh, uh, yes, uh, sinking, resinking of the loading of the existing structure, we're using lighter structure uh, to provide new vol volumes to change its uh, floor, but also the more important to change its high, ceiling high to make it um, uh, could be as mixed reuse. And here's a section to talking about the junction between old and new. Uh, and also looking at the edge, the boundary of the block and the performance of the elevation. In this sense, there will have a range of, of elevation architecture that we're talking about laying, depths, cutting away, permeability, and so on. And so that we can, could imagine what could happen here. In such um, university and knowledge cluster buildings, we're gonna looking for the opportunities that we can create those network spaces. And here we create some larger volume to for for larger events that creates an environment of collaboration and congregation. Um, so here is the complex uh, lower ground conditions we'll highlight with different color that show the different platforms. Uh, from the Ely, Ely place uh, and its extension to the back of that, got, the plat got that platform with connection to the Chathouse Street. And then we moved down to, to a lower ground that could be the patio between the uh, Ely place and the new student housing. And then we move forward and turn the right. So here we got a view to the plaza here. So that could be minus 4.8 meters. So through this space, we can have the view of the suffering hill. On the right hand, the plan, we can looking at the, uh, the blue color that will be suffering hill. And then we move down to the green uh, orange here that will be a square, have a auditorium. So this place could be used as festival celebration and some community events. Mm. And then talking about the suffering hill condition, we can looking at the changing of the uh, ground level. From the north to south, uh, at the entrance of the suffering hill at the gravel street, looking to the, to the down, downward to the south, we can get that view. And we're moving forward, and we can see that the elevation of two both sides of the building were opened up, so that would gathering more people and different activities happen here. And then we move to the end of Suffering Hill. We can see the gorgeous, fabulous um, light well, that will shape the, uh, the staircase. And then we're looking backwards. We can look at the both sides, the elevation and the uh, material of the existing structure and how it opened up and how people could use those um, uh, rich um, spaces. Then, the civic realm, civic realm also blend with university in different height. Uh, so here is the uh, third floor view that will, that will public realm got the view of the, to the city, also to the new London Museum, that people could uh, move upwards through that uh, wood staircase to the roof terrace. Also the same um, view could, could, be, could be generated in the university also in, in really uh, high uh, um, floors. And then we move to the terrace. Uh, we can imagine that community activities will have will held in that terrace. Uh, and here we step back and talk about the elevation as the block. So this elevation and those um, spaces gen generation could help those whole blocks uh, interact with neighborhood changing. And also, we can imagine the university, business, uh, commercial housing, and the uh, city museum will come together in the same screen uh, as, a block, uh, as a complex 
become a block. That will be a beginning to start to uh, adapt to reuse the existing structure and spaces in the center of city. As we can imagine, more generous public realm will run through the existing street blocks and so that we can encourage the development of the city fabric and the civic value, the public value. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ray. Great to see the work. And it's a super exciting project. Um, it's particularly nice for me to see such lovely, um, lovely hand drawings as well, which we enjoy. And, th and that balanced against the, the, the hard line renders as well is, is, is really lovely to see. Um, it's incredibly relevant because it's the sort of project that we're dealing with on a daily basis in London to look at um, kind of unpromising stock and, um, and rectifying that for, for, for contemporary use. I think, so it's great to see, I think on the education side of things, on the university side of things, I think it would be useful for the project to understand the specifics actually of what that use is. Because university education in a, is a pan of play. There are so many uses, all with different space demands, sectional height demands, MNE demands, social congregational demands, and all of that make for an incredibly complex um, puzzle to solve. So I think for your project, it would be really useful to have a declaration about what kind of faculty or communion of faculties would happen within it. And it would give it more credibility, I think, because you can then start to grapple with the nature of the spaces that are being generated here. So that's kind of one, <laughs> that's one thing. On the, the, if we take each, each bit, on the residential side, you have the old and the new, and I think there would be a benefit in the old and the new talking to each other a little bit more. The space in between seems to be a kind of canyon or, or a void. I think it would be more interesting if you could occupy that space somehow or give it a use. I know that you've got the pieces that cap over the top. That look quite interesting to me, actually, tectonically rich. But again, in terms of the uses where, the, where, the, where these two elements talk to each other or face each other, I think you could give that more meaning. Bringing us to the main point about the deep ground floor um, is I couldn't quite see what was happening at the heart of the scheme, in the middle of the scheme, what is going on. Is that a shared space between the residential and the university, the academic? Is it a separate space? Is it a community space? So outside of the community of, of the students, there's a use, which would be super interesting as well. So there's probably a point in the scheme as well where you introduce the neighborhood into it because it's knitted in and it'd be even more successfully knitted in if there was that sort of space within the scheme. Those are my initial kind of sort of points without really understanding the, the, the project, but good work, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I agree, it's super interesting and exciting. And the fact that you're, um, you've all, almost had to start by making value judgments on what bits of the block you keep and what you take away and which buildings you're actually working on. And I presume that was something that you thought about, that the Ely, Ely Place building was worth keeping and extending and then the corner uh, building onto uh, Farringdon Road was the one that you would mess about with a lot more. So th I think that, that was kind of interesting. I think what would be really helpful is just some, um, some diagram. You had some very simple diagrams of the spaces in the middle, but what was quite difficult to take in is how much of the Charterhouse Square Farringdon Road building you're actually retaining. It was a cross section that showed new floors and things, but it would be really good if you could find a way of communicating how much of the existing fabric is adapted and reused and how much is new and, and somehow communicate that and why the new bits are there and what they're doing is distinct from the existing fabric. Um, I agree with the comment on the extension to the Ely Square, Ely Place building as well. It would be good if there was a bit more dialogue between your new intervention and the existing Georgian block, but also how your 
student accommodation, how does it actually interface with the Farringdon Road building and what, how do they join together in the central space? It was quite unclear as to whether you had to walk around the block or whether you actually are bringing people into the center of the, the site. And then the third point, well, the third observation really was um, it's a very interior conversation. It's all about what happens inside. And I just wondered whether you considered the exterior uh, contributions to the streetscape and you know, permeable facades, whether they are active frontages. The main entrance is clearly right on the dynamic corner, which is kind of exciting. But you had some really interesting um, like collage elevations, which were very much about looking at the block from the outside. And I, th I think if you could sort of give a bit of attention to the perimeter, how the street perception of the building works as, as, as dynamically as you've done the interior, I think that could, that could really help the whole thing read. But on, on the whole, I thought it was a really, really challenging project. It's, it's, I'm drawing a lot into the sort of obfuscation in the middle, you know, where, where I'm interpreting what you're saying, but it would be quite, it, I think with a few more simple diagrams, you could actually explain how the, um, how the buildings work. And I think that specificity about what the faculty is and how it's used and what, what the sort of community of students is going to be would really help as well. Um, and I, I like the idea of getting up high in the building as well, the roof terraces and looking over that part of the city would be really dynamic. Because it's a very different contrast to the sort of garret attic stories that historically would have been in that area. You're making a public realm at the top of the building, which again is quite, quite dramatic. Um, but no, there's a lot to take in. I mean, it was a, <laughs> it's quite a journey in, in, in a couple of minutes to get through it. But really, there's some really dynamic uh, moments, I think, which could be great. Thank you. No, I, I agree with, with the comments that have uh, uh, gone before me. So I'll just perhaps focus on um, what hasn't been said. I agree with, with, with both observation. I think for me, the most, uh, I thought, most seductive aspect of the project, and I thought the most one that has most potential, is your idea of considering the block, um, as you said, uh, as a building, mm -hmm. right? And in extension to that, I can imagine the desire is to draw upon or tap upon the kind of urban resources that a building actually draws on, but actually to internalize them, to draw them closer into the building. And in such a way that to bring about a sense of cityness into the building itself, right? And I think that premise, I think, is very promising because I think with regards to precedent that you've shown, and some other precedents, we know that there has been many attempts by architects to look at uh, what we call interior urbanism. That is to say that to conceive of a building as it were a project of the city. And I think this is where the project has most legs, right? And the closest I think I could think of in terms of uh, an interesting precedent which you haven't brought up, I thought those precedents you brought up are interesting, uh, one that I thought was perhaps uh, I could add to it is uh, Rem's uh, Juicio Library, if you know that project. Essentially, it's to conceive the library as a continuous street, a promenade that starts from the city and then begins to ramp and to fall upwards, almost as bifurcated plates. And as it moves upwards to form a block of a building, the structure is very stable. It is a grid, right? And uh, equal potential grid, and in which by just the nature of different floor plates uh, colliding, bifurcating, you know, coming in together, changes the way in which we understand what a library is. What, how do we stack books? How do we place seminar rooms? How do we place reading areas and so on and so forth? So I think where the project could gain more clarity is precisely thinking about what are the constraints? Well, first, what are the opportunities that will be afforded if we are to think of the city or urban resources, the character of a city outside is drawn into a building and how that changes the way we think of spaces that are interior? How does that inside and outside transform each other? And then secondly, with regards to where Juicio Library has a grid that is imposed, which is, uh, I think, was an 8x8 grid or a 12x12 concrete frame grid, your structural grid, if anything, is not generic, is given. And I think because it is given, because it is existing, it gives a certain fixity, 
but also something to react against, right? So in that sense, all the ramps, the staircases, all the amphitheaters needs to react to that precisely because one of the largest or one of the most important reason why you think about reusing and retrofitting is to reduce its carbon footprint. That is to say, to keep the part of the building, the structure, which guzzles up the most carbon intact, right? So therefore, I think the, the, the choreography in addressing these two issues, in interiorizing the aspect of a city, but also agitating that against a structure that is immovable, I think becomes, will produce an interior architecture that will be super fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. I'm sticking up behind you. I just a couple of comments. I think that build on on some of the others. I think the the REM reference is really good. The the other one I was thinking of is the um, the Dutch Embassy in Berlin which is then modeled as this continuous space. And then every volume within that building has an interrelationship with another one. So you, some of them are a little bit forced. And then it has this orientation towards the, the TV tower. But I think it's more to do with the way in which you describe your ideas. It's an incredibly complex project, and it's quite hard to pick apart. And you've packed a lot in. And I, again, I love the hand drawings. I totally agree. And it's really good to see them. And I, we never see enough of them. But there is that sort of the way in which a diagram can work is it can describe the same idea in, from multiple viewpoints. So from the entire block through to whether or not you're actually interconnecting spaces or you're carving out a piece of urbanity. And that distinction is incredibly important because then when you come to produce the renders, you produce renders that are incredibly clean, which is the problem with renders. But they remind me a little bit about, of the area around King's Cross, which are actually quite generous spaces between quite formal blocks. And I think you'll find that the spaces that you've created are quite small and they will have the rough edges of the backs of houses of, or the backs of buildings, the back of house of, of buildings that has a richness that a place like King's Cross doesn't have. And I think the, the compression and the variation of those spaces is something that would really give a project like this a tremendous amount of um, weight within the city then actually you're underplaying the actual housing component of this. This is really much more to do with an urban, an urban scheme or an understanding, a rereading of the urban condition. And perhaps maybe there's a bit more you could make of that. And then the last reference, I, I, I sort of accidentally ended up at the 20th anniversary event of the Laban, which um, it was something that sort of fell into my calendar. I didn't know what it was, and I turned up and had the most amazing evening. But that was a project was that, that was described in some very, very simple models like, that you could hold in your hand and through a simple set of drawings. And then at the end of the, the presentation, they had a performance. And the, the people, the, the students there, they were in their first term of their masters, um, similar to sort of AIS, and they were performing all over the building, which also has the status of a sort of internal street that has very incidental moments of interaction with the studio, with the dance studios. And there's a playfulness to it that is also very Swiss. <laughs> and the combination of it was actually extremely delightful. In those spaces, you also have at least one that runs up into the roof and is a sort of a nonsense space. And that comes out of a collision of geometries that then become something probably beyond a building code, but really delightful. And I think there's moments within this project that could be very similar. But if you can begin to tease out the various themes through a set of diagrams, it would build perhaps a stronger thesis as well. But thank you so much. Thank you. I, I appreciate very much these comments. It, it, it opens up, I think, in a way, even more uh, potential in what you were aiming to do, Ray. And I, I think it, it's, it's fantastic that we're starting to open up these questions because we, we begin to, to see, in a way, the challenge and the complexity that, that the field is facing. And it invites us to think uh, a little bit more deeply about what kinds of things need to be explored in academia and taught. And, you know, I, I know that because it was 12 minutes, you're having to strip out a lot, but just kind of coming back to some of the things that you stripped out, um, you stripped out quite a bit of your exploration of 
other approaches to newly designed university buildings and what we learned from that. You also stripped out a lot of the conversations about what happens when we take the facade off and what do we see and then how do we respond to that. And it, you also, in a way, stripped out a lot of how I think, you know, the, the question was raised, what does is, what is your street side elevation start to look like and, and do? And, and I would love to see those drawings come back in especially. But uh, Chris's comment about sitting, sittiness in a way it helps me think about bringing some of these things together. Because um, if we say there's indeed a found structure and it's got certain regularities and rhythms and you're, you're trying to decide how to make use of the spaces that become open and available within this block and make decisions about which ones will become more plaza-like and uh, offer opportunities for congregation. Then you're starting to ask the question, what does that assembly mean, both to the institution that manages this space, and that comes back to Lee's point, and why that would be of urban value? And so it's this, this kind of crossover between the, the university as an actor and their interaction and uh, both contribution to and uh, der derivation of value from engaging with the city. So universities have this wonderful, you know, in a way, just like the AA is, we, we host events that are public in nature and we can fit a certain number of, uh, of guests in this room. And then after that, we rely upon, uh, we rely upon streaming. But of course, most universities have opportunities for much larger gatherings. And we, if we ask the question, what is the real value of that to the city? Most universities have these opportunities to host really significant events in person. So what would that do? Uh, to the the community of Clerkenwell? How would that enable that to change? And if it could change in that way, what would the entrance to that building look like? If it now has a kind of grandeur, because it's in fact a really significant place within the life of the city, uh, we, would, we would be wanting to see the interrelationship between the two. So um, I, I think all of the things that you have done, they show a tremendous feel for uh, the the levels, the section, the possible openings, and we, you know, in in terms of watching your work develop, we could see how you had a feel for those spaces. What would be really nice is if you would articulate how you made the decisions in relation to the structure um, that you found, and in a way, in in relation to say Lee's question about so what kind of university do you really imagine this to be? And I know at one point. You were, you were thinking in terms of labs, and we said, oh, leave that out. It's going to become technically too complicated. Um, and, um, uh, and, and so then, but if it isn't that, what, what kind of space is it, and what does it contribute to the wider area? I think that's, um, that's also a point about what attracted you to this particular corner of the block to do your intervention. Was there something specific about the found space in that building? Was there something sort of visceral about it that you felt you could work with? And I think that's why I asked the question about the retention, because it, it, it does on one reading look like you've taken most of it away, but actually I, I don't think you have. I think you've got quite a lot of retained fabric, and it'd be really kind of interesting to see um, a little bit uh, like, the, like the comment about what are the real constraints here. If you, if you have certain constraints you have to kick against, you, you, you work with the, the space that you found, the qualities of that space, it's kind of gnarly, quite raw and gritty, and, and that gives you something to sort of move against. Um, so I, I, I just think those are just sort of, they're just hanging there a little bit about what, what attracted you to this block, what attracted you to the Georgian block, and why didn't you consider the other blocks, and, and the contrast between the two, uh, if you're talking about the whole block being a building, is, is kind of important information really about why this corner, I mean, civically, that corner is the most important one, isn't it? Because it's moving towards the station. So that's, that answers some of it. But I'd really love to know why you've chosen to take some of the floors away and not all the floors, and where you've made your interventions. I think it would really help build a richness into the, into the, you know, the dialogue between the new bit and the, the existing, really. Because 
part of the challenges we have a lot in retaining buildings is not not just why because of the carbon footprint but why, what can you use them for what is good about this space that you don't get in other buildings and often it's the proportional heights are better the floor loadings are, and the structure could be more robust than you, you'd get in a new building and, and they have certain qualities that you want to sort of like riff against almost and, and work with and I, I think just something is probably as you say it's probably in the portfolio somewhere that an analysis of the qualities that you were attracted to in that building and how you've responded to those would, would really help diagram ray is is actually where where does the university start i'm just thinking about the academic side of it at what point was what is the bubble of the university and what is the civic bit where and where do they meet and it's not on the corner at the door it's probably pushing the civic realm into the building somewhat in some somehow and up into the building so they're fused and fluid I think that would be an interesting diagram to work out what what is the private and what is the public you know at its most coarse I think that would be really useful great thank you thank you uh, I think this opens up uh, a, a, a level of interest and ambition that we would like to see further developed in, in h and uh, This is the first time we've seen a project of this sort within the program. And I think we've learned a lot from trying to figure out what exactly needs to be explored in order to make this credible. Um, and uh, I think, Ray, you've, you've uh, you've accepted the challenge beautifully well and helped us understand a, a little bit more just how rich and also challenging the the uh, the uh, the problem of adaptive reuse can be in dense central city environments. So thank you for that. We appreciate it. Thank you.